Good evening. Time for the press preview then. It's a uh, first chance to check out Sunday's front pages and tonight we'll have a look at them with the journalist and author Christina Patterson who's joined by the former number 10 speechwriter Asa Bennett. Great to see you both this Saturday evening. We'll chat in a moment after we've had a look at uh, those front pages for you. We're going to begin with the Sunday Express, leading with the headline, For pity's sake, stop the boats, after six people died after they tried to cross the channel. Well, the Mirror has the same story, writing, How many more must die before the Tories get a grip? Also reflecting on the tragic channel deaths. Here's the Sunday People, also reporting on the tragedy, with an image of the survivors being taken to shore on its front cover. The Observer says today's deaths have prompted fresh anger towards the government and its controversial asylum policy. And the Sunday Telegraph says the government might start housing asylum seekers in offices and student accommodation blocks. Elsewhere, the Sunday Times leads on calls for tougher A-level grading to halt the surge in students dropping out of university. And the Daily Star claims scientists have come up with a new idea to contact aliens by inviting them to play chess. And just to remind you, you can scan the QR code that you see on screen during the programme. Uh, check out the front pages of the papers while you're watching us discuss them. And to do that, Christina Patterson and Asa Bennett. Uh, lovely to see you both this uh, Saturday evening. Um, lots to talk about. Uh, the awful events in the channel, Christina, uh, dominating the front pages. Uh, and interesting to see... Um, uh, the front of the Express, for pity's sake, stop the boats. Different papers coming up with uh, different solutions, I guess, uh, whether it's the Telegraph talking about increasing the deterrent or it's the Observer talking about improving the means of getting here legally, um, or, or maybe it's a bit of both, but whatever uh, it is, there needs to be a solution soon. There does need to be a solution soon, but uh, it's not the easiest thing to find a solution for. It really has been a disastrous week for the Tories in terms of their so-called stop the boat policies and an absolutely tragic end to it. But I think really the fact that they are trying to make this a kind of electoral issue and, and also a culture war issue, it's very depressing and very upsetting and here we see the reality of it people who have lost their lives because it's a very complex issue and by pretending that it can be solved by this policy or that policy it doesn't do justice to the complexity of, of the issue it is true that there are not currently many legal routes into the uk there are for ukrainians and there are for people from hong kong but certainly for most people in the world who are escaping war or disaster there are not currently legal routes uh, so you know that is an issue but we can't pretend that we can offer asylum to everybody in the whole world who is eligible for it. It's just not practical. And the, the reality is that these people are not getting, they can't kind of manufacture a boat and make it here on their own. They're getting here because of people smugglers who are utterly amoral, who are perfectly happy to see them die, taking their money and offering them boats that are likely to sink. And as we have seen tragically today, do sink, relying on uh, uh, people in both France and the UK to rescue them. What we need to do is to break the people smugglers' gangs. That's the key thing that needs to happen here. And offering endless amounts of more accommodation, deterrence or whatever is just not going to solve the problem. But it also has to be said that there is an enormous backlog. And the reason we have so many people who have to be housed at the expense of the British, at the cost to the British taxpayer, is because we have this enormous backlog. So this is an issue of enormous incompetence from the government. But it is also true that there aren't simple problems, simple solutions to it. And it, and I, and it makes me mm. angry when people pretend there are. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, front of the mirror, Asa, how many more must die before Tories get a grip? A picture there of the, the lifeboat that was involved in that uh, uh, dawn rescue. Um, uh, I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this? It's, it's, it's just almost impossible mm. to come up with a solution to this, isn't it? And it has become so politicised. 
Well, certainly what's very striking is how this issue, in many ways, actually across, it, it cuts across party lines, because you have there the Express and the Mirror, both newspapers with very different uh, you know, political wings that they would sort of lean towards. And both of them are then shining a light on this and saying, you know, this cannot go on, something must be done. Of course, as you're saying, the real just debate is what is that something? Um, you know, we've seen this is you know, the government's view. This is their stop the boats week when they really show that they've got a grip of the issue. Um, and yet there's also a poll we've seen showing that only one in 10 of those surveyed among the electorates think that the government really is succeeding in trying to turn the tide here. And it really is striking when you see the scale of human tragedy like this, you know, as Christina was talking about, you know, the, the people, these innocent people are basically victims of criminal smuggling gangs who are then trying to offer them, you know, the hope of salvation, but admittedly on ramshackle death traps. Um, and as a result, you know, they're almost engineering humanitarian crises on our doorstop. Um, and so that's why the government's trying to work overtime to try and stop, you know, to try and destroy the deterrent, to, to apply deterrent, to destroy the incentive and to destroy the business model. Um, but then, as you can see, these measures are all have their own complications with the baby Stockholm having a sort of outbreak of Legionnaire's disease and what led seemingly bacteria infested waters. Um, you don't sort of try to get more barges in. You know, the challenge goes on, basically. Yeah, well, let's talk about that next, shall we? Because it's uh, on the front of the Sunday Telegraph. Ministers want more barges, Christina, for asylum uh, seekers. We saw those 39, uh, I think it was, migrants on board the barge in, in Dorset having to be removed because of, uh, of uh, Legionella, as, uh, as Asa was saying. Um, are more barges the solution? Really not. I mean, they can't even make one barge work. You know, they, I mean, that, this week has been a total farce. They finally got 39 people on that barge. And the minute they get them on, they have to wheel them off because of the threat of legionnaires. So barges are clearly not the answer. I mean, as I said before, it, one of the central answers has to be to speed up the, the processing. Um, the fact that people are waiting many months to get their paperwork considered is ridiculous and they've enormously increased the number of staff in the home office so i don't understand why it's taking so long for this but you know, why there's such mass incompetence here but barges are clearly not the answer well are they I, not i, are they not think... the, I mean sorry christine to 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 uh, mm. to interrupt but if it, i mean the legion airs thing obviously is a, is a is a nightmare but if it, if it wasn't for that are they really not the answer or, or are they quite a sensible oh. solution rather than spending millions a week on hotels no, I, I don't. I don't. I'm not saying that it's wrong to put them on barges. I'm saying okay. that they're not the answer. Um, I think it is. I think it's absolutely crazy that the British taxpayer is putting asylum seekers in inexpensive hotels, and as some politicians have said, hotels that most people couldn't afford to pay in to stay in themselves. So I'm. I'm. I don't disapprove of asylum seekers being put in pretty basic accommodation. There is talk of using um, former student accommodation. Um, all kinds of, uh, you know, offered blocks even. That's, as, as long as it's safe accommodation without Legionnaire's bacteria and with, you know, food and, uh, and bathroom accommodation, I think that's fine. But none of these things are the answer. The answer is to solve the problem, is to hit the people smugglers, it's to get the, the whole processing under control, it's to form proper agreements with France, it's to get the policing, to get the, the coast policed in both the UK and in France. It's not to keep expanding enormous swathes of accommodation. That's clearly not going to, you know, it's just going to increase the number of people coming over here if they think there's limitless accommodation to put them up. Yeah, it's interesting, Asa, the, uh, the shadow immigration mm. minister today talking about um, uh, the barges being w one of a number of gimmicky madcap schemes by the government. But do, do you feel that Labour have got a handle on this? You know, we're approaching a, a general election in the not-too-distant future. Where does Labour stand on all of this, how they could um, solve the problem? I'm afraid we, we, you know, Labour as the opposition, you'd expect them to criticise, yes, but then they, the government's natural repost will be, well, where are your ideas? And they, they're being rather shy at the moment because they're obviously trapped between two sort of poles. And on the one hand, there's parts of their party that would want them to go full throttle in opening safe and more safe and legal routes. Um, but then the argument can be that you're just encouraging more people to come in and apply for asylum and, you know, to, uh, and then of course, then the others who understand, you know, you know, 
a post-Brexit Britain, that you do need to try and show control over migration. You do need to try and have the work as the government's doing, in which you work with the French to try and have more people, you know, stay in Europe or the first country they land rather than going on to Britain. Um, you know, and just generally show that element of grip. Um, and so they try and see that Labour cannot go soft on this. So that's why they really are, you know, stuck on the fence over this issue. Uh, welcome back to the press preview. Christina and Asa are still with me. Uh, let's have a look at the front of the Observer, Christina. Great photo there, actually. Um, Alex Greenwood, uh, the uh, the Lioness player, consoling uh, one of Colombia's team after um, that uh, fantastic victory. I don't know if you saw the game. The last few minutes were nail biting, weren't they? When they went into extra time. I'm afraid I didn't see the game. I'm, I'm with some people who are big supporters. A friend of mine's been watching every game so far. But um, I found this photo really moving, actually. I think I find the, the women, the, the lionesses, extremely inspirational women. The, the efforts they must have had to make to get to where they are in a country where women's football has not had huge funding poured into it and boy have they been able to show the men how to do it they've shown male football players how to win which has been fantastic but this particular photo of of compassion and support for that Colombian player after they lost after the team lost I thought was just very very touching so I mean the whole thing is cheering and it's one of the I have to say one of the few things that has given me a free song of patriotic pride recently is is the lionesses so you know all hail to them yeah and uh, yeah. the next game the semi-final clash Acer is on Wednesday uh, where they're going to play the host Australia that is going to be uh, a tough match I mean, you were speaking about nail biting. You know, earlier. this is, in my view, the real nail biter to come because Australia, you know, yes, they're the hosts. And this summer, I mean, in terms of sport, we've seemed to have, like, let's put it this way. I want to cheers the rafters for the Lionesses. I want to hope that after the Euros, they will have nothing but success after success. Yet the Aussies, you know, in, in netball, they won the World Cup for that this summer. They also were winning the Ashes this summer as well. They've come over with the trophies time after time lately. So I'm slightly worried about the, you know, what track record they may bring to the pitch this time. OK, all right. Let's uh, move on to uh, something completely different, ULEZ. Um, in fact, Ata, why don't you kick off uh, this for us? Sunday Telegraph, uh, Labour's going to drop its pledge to, uh, to roll out those ULEZ zones. Yes, bad news for Sally Khan. It seems that the uh, rowback continues after Uxbridge, in which it seemed very clear that uh, they did not like the idea of ULEZ expanding further and taxing more people around London. Um, and so much so that Labour, you know, Keir Starmer has said that he wants to uh, give the Tories the fewest chances possible to attack Labour policy. I think he basically put it to the party that if Labour policy is on Tory leaflets, you know, something's gone very wrong. And so the ULEZ is clearly candidate number one. Um, there's an interesting point that could be made, of course, if, if you are you know, a Labour supporter, which is that well, you, you just might just slightly worry about how strong Mr Starmer's convictions are if effectively he's taking a kind of Groucho Marx approach to his uh, your policies of, you know, if you don't like these principles, I have others. Yeah, Christina, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, green issues are coming to the fore a lot at the moment as we all uh, deal with the cost of living crisis because um, the burden um, that they can bring on people who are short of money is uh, pretty big, isn't it? And, and, and it doesn't seem that um, politicians quite yet are grasping that fact that if they want us all to be greener, then they need to help us with, do it financially in, in a financial way. Well, I think that's exactly right. And I think that was the problem in the Uxbridge uh, by-election. And I think politicians haven't given enough thought to that. And although I applaud Sadiq Khan's efforts and in that they clearly have improved air quality in London and children, you know, will have much healthier lives as a result of them. There was that, that poor child who died of severe asthma, which was proven to be through air pollution some years ago. So clearly it's the right thing to do, but the issue is who pays? And at the moment, as with every other issue, it's the people who can afford at least to pay the highest price. And I think the thing is, I mean, I, I do agree that we don't, increasingly it seems we don't actually know what Keir Starmer does stand for in certain ways. But I also think he is absolutely clear that you can't do anything at all unless you win an election. 
Association, which Labour has not seen to grasp for many, many years. And uh, so you can kind of work out some of what you're going to do later. But unless you're at the table or in the room, as, as you know, in, in the musical Hamilton, if you're not in the room where it happens, you can't make anything happen. And um, I think Labour clearly has much greener policies than the Tory party. And it has recently, as we know, um, Ben Goldsmith recently resigned because um, he claims that he thinks that Rishi Sunak doesn't care about the environment at all. And I have to say, Rishi Sunak has given a very good impression of not caring at all about the environment. I think since COP, whatever it was, um, uh, I always forget the name of it, but the, the, you know, when we were making all those grand um, some statements about wanting to reach net zero, the government stance has been absolutely pathetic and they are rowing back on pretty much every target they have, have you know, set before now. So clearly a Labour government is going to be more active on the environment than a Tory government. But you have to, as I think it says in this article, or as Labour have agreed, you have to step quite carefully and make sure that the people who don't mm. pay the most are the people who can afford it least. Mm. OK, all right. Well, listen, we've been talking a lot about uh, politicians and elections, and the Mail on Sunday has uh, an interesting article. They've done a State of the Nation poll, um, as, uh, uh, as would be expected, um, I guess, in terms of voting intention. Uh, Labour is uh, well ahead on 46 points compared to the Conservatives on 29. Um, but what is perhaps a bit more interesting uh, is some of the, the, the other detail about Keir Starmer and uh, Rishi Sunak. For example, the question, do you imagine that Sunak or Starmer would be better for each of the following? And there's various uh, details here. Joining you for a night out, who would you prefer? Rishi Sunak gets 25% of the vote. Keir Starmer gets 33%. Asa, uh, going on a long journey, who mm. would you prefer to go with? Rishi Sunak, 24%. Keir Starmer, 34%. Well, look, I, I side with the majority uh, on all these questions. Two-thirds of them clearly saying neither. Um, and it's particularly <laughs> clear when you see that, you know, let's put it this way, if you want the fastest way to end a night out, bring one of them along. Um, that's clearly what the conclusions are from this. And you can see why it's a really furtive endorsement one way or the other. Seemingly, Keir Starmer will be best with your children if you want a babysitter. If you want Rishi Sunak to run a business, he, you know, if you want someone to run a business, he's your guy. Um, but no, I mean, the silent majority is very clear. I wish they were forcing people to make a choice, though, at least, because don't know is the easy, easiest option possible. Christina? Well, I, I think that's absolutely right in terms of the majority not wanting. I think that people's heart would absolutely sink at the thought of a long car journey with, with either of them. But, um, but I do think, you know, we had the great entertainer and he made a terrible mess of the country. So I'm personally, I'm perfectly happy to have people in, start, in, in charge now who are not a barrel of laughs but are uh, sort of vaguely competent. And unfortunately, the Tories under Rishi Sunak are not showing themselves to be particularly competent, although it has to be said that, I, that Rishi Sunak is a lot more competent than his predecessor and his predecessor's predecessor, though it's not saying a lot. And I, I suspect that Keir Starmer mm. will be pretty competent. He's a kind of solid, serious guy, but he will inherit such a terrible mess with this country that, okay. you know, he can't perform miracles. So no doubt he'll have masses to grapple with and probably not do very well at a lot of it. But at least I believe he will be trying to do his best and he will be getting good advice yeah. and going with some of the evidence, which yeah. is not something that's happened all that much in recent years. Yeah, certainly according to the Mail on Sunday, uh, Keir Starmer would be uh, more reliable feeding your cat when you're on holiday uh, than uh, Rishi Sunak. Thank you both very much. We'll